All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, thank you all so much for coming at the end of Monday here at South by Southwest. Um, my name is RJ Owen, and <laughs> before I get started, I just want to say again, thank you so much for coming. Um, I know a lot of you guys uh, have plenty of options on things you could be doing right now. There's like 500 sessions going on at any one time, so I really appreciate that you're here to talk about the Power Glove with me today. Um, so let's let's get right into it. Um, I heard a talk this past fall by an animator at Pixar who said that you should never start your talk with who you are. You should never do that. Here's who I am. This is about me. You should hit the audience really hard with something like tell a story, give them the reason to care about who you are, and then talk about who you are. And I tried to do that several times, and it, none of it made any sense. So my apologies, but... Um, <laughs> My name is RJ Owen. I work for a company called Effective UI in Denver, Colorado. We're a full service user experience agency, which means we do design research, uh, product and, and digital design and development. And I started there about six or eight years ago as a developer. And my background so was physics and computer science before that. So I came into this as a programmer. And then about two years ago, uh, I started working with our design research group, kind of taking the totally other end of the spectrum. So in development, you get some designs that you may or may not have been involved in in producing, and then you have to build it. And so I saw lots of uh, interesting ideas on what users might want. And as a developer, you're the first user. You're the first person to test the software and start to figure out, like, this doesn't make any sense. That button shouldn't be there. This feature shouldn't even be in the product, things like that. So it got me really interested um, in being involved on the other side and getting to figure out what do users really want what do people really need in their software? And so that's what I do now, like full time in my role as a, uh, as a lead experience planner. It's, it's really fun. Um, but besides those two perspectives, the user perspective, technology perspective, I also have an MBA. So I have a, a business perspective. I've, I know at least like the textbook version of what happens in a company. And I've seen a lot in my years as a consultant here. So um, those three perspectives, technology, business, and the user perspective, will become important later on in our talk. So that's foreshadowing for all these storytelling people. Um, so let's get back into the Power Glove. Pixar guy would be happier now. Uh, the Power Glove is a video game controller that came out in 1989. Uh, it was produced by Mattel for the Nintendo. I have a Power Glove here. It's the real thing. And it was interesting because it was the first video game controller that you could wear. You would put this glove on your hand, and the idea was that you could control what was going on on the screen by the way that you would move your hand back and forth. Um, it has two main ways of interacting with a video game. The first is that it uses a sensor bar, a lot like the Wii, except it was an old, clunky sensor bar back in the day. And it, that allows the glove to detect where it is in space and its orientation. So it knows where it is, uh, X, Y, Z axis, and it knows if it's like rolled to the right or left or something like that. And along with being able to detect where it is in space, the glove can also detect how your fingers are flexed. So each finger has um, two degrees of flex that, the, that it'll pick up. Um, and all of these things are used to determine uh, different actions in a game. So these are just, this, this slide and the one before it are two pages and probably like a 40 page um, instruction guide that came with the Power Glove. And there's lots of different ways you can configure it to make different motions map to the different buttons on a Nintendo controller. So a normal Nintendo controller has a directional pad and then it has the buttons A and B. And so there's different combinations of ways you can set up the Power Glove so that like in this one, flexing your thumb is the A button Flexing your pointer finger is the B button. And then there's another way to do B where you can also move sideways if you flex three fingers and roll to your right. So there's all sorts of different control schemes. Uh, on the actual glove itself, we've got all these buttons across the top. And these like uh, 10 or 16 buttons or whatever are just for programming the glove to say, I want to use mode eight or whatever. And then these buttons down here are just another Nintendo <coughs> control, controller. So you've got the control pad, and you've got A, B, start, select, so that while you're wearing the glove, if you needed to do any like fine-tune precision work, you could, you could use these buttons. <laughs> so when the glove came out, uh, Nintendo also released two games, and this was kind of the more iconic one. It's called Super Glove Ball, and the idea in this game, it's, uh, it's kind of like Block Breaker in 3D, if you've ever played Block Breaker and you all have, whether you know it or not. 
But you would, uh, your glove, which is a really interesting avatar to play, I don't know if anyone had ever thought of themselves as a glove before, but you grab a ball and you throw it in this 3D space and you're trying to hit all these different colored lights enough times that they go away. Just like the 2D block breaker, but now you're in 3D. Um, it made sense to a lot of people, so it was in a lot of commercials. It was a pretty interesting game. And so along with the games that came out, there was also, of course, the marketing. These are some shots from the original Power Glove commercial. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because I have other videos I want you to be able to focus on. But in this video, you've got this awesome 80s dude wearing like a leather jacket with a collar flipped up or something, and he strolls into an abandoned warehouse. I don't know why there are always abandoned warehouses in the 80s. Maybe the 80s was a time of depression in the United States where warehouses were cropping up everywhere and no one wanted to do anything with them. He strolls into an abandoned warehouse thrusts on a power glove and blue lightning crackles down his arm. And of course there's a gigantic video screen in front of him and it starts lighting up with different games. And he starts interacting with the games and he's driving planes and he's shooting bad guys and he's punching people and stuff like that. And so the idea, the story that they were telling here, the thing that they were promising you was this new immersion in your game, this new connection to technology that you as a user would have never had before. And that really appealed to people, and that story really sold people, and it made the Power Glove um, something that we still think of today. So I ran into this device as like a seven-year-old kid, and at the time, I thought it was, was super cool because I was into superheroes, like many of you probably were. Um, I'm still kind of into superheroes, but at the time, I was very into superheroes, I once tried to dress up as Gizmo Duck for Halloween. I had this whole project plan where I was going to learn to unicycle so that I could ride that thing around and look like Gizmo Duck. And needless to say, it did not work. But some of the superheroes that I liked the most were the heroes that used technology to become heroic or to become super. So guys like Mega Man and Iron Man, um, who, who were just normal people, normal intelligent people, I guess. Uh, maybe not Mega Man so much, but anyway, you put on this suit. <laughs> use technology and you'd become uh, some sort of super person. You'd connect yourself to computer and technology and be able to do things you never could before and save people and solve problems. And so I spent a lot of time looking like this as a kid, <laughs> running around wearing tin foil and cardboard boxes and things. Um, my sunglasses still kind of look like that. And so for me, it's interesting, but I didn't have a Nintendo. My parents were afraid that Satan was manipulating the world through Nintendo at the time. We've discovered since that he was not, but on the safe side, we didn't get one. And so I, I didn't really play Nintendo. I was that kid who would come over to your house and want to play Nintendo the whole time we were there. And if we took turns, I would die in like five seconds because I, I didn't have one. I was terrible at the games. But I had a friend who had a power glove. And so I would borrow this thing from him and I would take it home and I would play with it for like days on end. I would refuse to take it off because I became like Cyborg Man when I wore it. And I thought it was so cool and so fun. So for me, the part that I connected to of this device had nothing to do with playing video games. It was completely a costume for me. And it was the promise of being able to connect to and integrate myself with technology in a new way. And I think it's that promise that has made the Power Glove like firmly locked in our imaginations for those of us who experienced that, including Stephen Colbert, this is a, a picture from last week. This is a show last week, if any of you guys caught this clip. He does this like virtual reality thing where he goes to a, a virtual reality political convention. And so the only two things he needs to establish that he's in virtual reality mode are some goofy headset thing and a power glove. And all of a sudden he's acting like he's manipulating a virtual world and like that's enough to sell it. So I think it's still locked in our memory. I don't know what that is, but it's not me. Um, so as a kid, I encountered the glove as like a costume piece, and then as an adult, I discovered it again reading this book, Sketching User Experiences by Bill Buxton. Uh, Bill Buxton is a principal researcher at Microsoft and a really brilliant guy. This book is amazing. If you haven't read it and you're into interaction design, I would highly, highly recommend it. But in the, in the book, he has several case studies where he talks about different products, how they did in the market, and the type of research that was done on them. And in, in one of those, he talks about the Power Glove. And it was interesting to me because he talked about it as a colossal failure. And I didn't know that. I only knew it as this awesome thing that 
made me feel really cool as a little kid. And so it was interesting to me to learn how bad it was. And I started to dig in to why this glow was so awful, why it was so terrible, and what happened. And inevitably, if you start Googling for the power glove, you will quickly stumble upon this. Yes. The wizard. How many people saw the wizard as kids? Wow, that's a lot more than I expected. That's great. Um, <laughs> So as you will recall, The Wizard was a 90-minute commercial for Mario 3 and the Power Glove, <laughs> starring Fred Savage. It's Fred Savage who really sells the Power Glove. But you can see him, he's still wearing it here in, in the thing. Um, and so to remind you, since so many of you have seen it, what this was like, I've got a clip I want to show you. Um, and in this clip, we're going to be introduced to Lucas Barton, the bad guy. And Lucas Barton, well, so the plot, of, the plot of The Wizard, let me just back up a second, is that Fred Savage here, um, his little brother is a video game genius, <coughs> and they're going to compete in some like world championship video game thing. And along the way, um, they pick up this chick, and they run into Lucas Barton. And Lucas Barton is a typical 80s bad guy. He's got a mullet. He's kind of a bully. He has freckles. The 80s people with mullets and freckles were always bullies. And um, now they're hipsters. <laughs> and he, he, was, he was a real jerk. And he was kind of rich, like he owned all the video games. And um, so in this clip, they're going to meet him, and he's going to try to impress them at how good he is at video games. Uh, and he's going to show off the Power Glove. And as part of that, he's going to play a game with the Power Glove. And uh, so I'm going to put this on here. But I would like all of you to participate in this experience so that you can get a little glimpse firsthand into what it's like to play the glove. So if you remember, um, the, the power glove has to be pointed at those three control uh, things on the screen. And there's actually a page in the instruction booklet that says you have to hold your hand at a 90 degree angle pointed at your TV to play the game. So I'd like you all to hold your hands up like this right now. And as we watch this clip and Lucas plays the game, uh, just act like you're playing the game with him. So sort of drive back and forth. And then don't put your arm down until the clip's done. It's going to be about two and a half minutes. And <laughs> so it's not that long. And that's about how long it would normally take to play the game he's playing, which is, which is a rad racer. So here we go. Audio, audio, audio. What happened? <laughs> you got you ready? Did you go? Okay, we'll try it here. It is totally plugged in. I knew this was gonna happen. <coughs> we tested it and everything. <laughs> Absurd, right? <laughs> and this thing was meant to play every Nintendo game at the time, which included 
uh, The Legend of Zelda and oh. Link 2, which as you remember, you, you'd play for like six hours. So imagine doing this, right? <laughs> like either your arm's gonna fall off or you're gonna have a shoulder muscle like this huge by the time you're done. So you have all these lopsided children with giant shoulders, power glove shoulder. Um, so that's just one of the things that went wrong with making the power glove. Digging into it a little bit more, uh, I discovered some other interesting facts. The Power Glove was rated the seventh worst video game controller of all time by IGN. What's worse? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of amazing. I'll let you figure out what's worse. You can go check them out. There's some really weird stuff in there. Um, it did not sell anywhere near what it was supposed to in the United States, and that caused the Japanese producer of the device to go out of business. So it was a total failure in the market. Nobody bought it, even though so many of us remember it, in part thanks to that commercial. Um, and so, Another interesting thing that I found as I was researching this is that there's lots of videos of people complaining about the Power Glove online. Uh, this is one from a guy named Angry Nerd Blog that one of my, my coworker Dan sent me. And uh, so you can watch him here. He's going to try to play the game Life Force. Down, down, come on, down, down. No, don't walk down. <laughs> down. Left, go back, come on, go back. Go left, go left. So he, he goes on for a while and then he starts ranting and this guy curses like crazy so I cut a lot of it out because um, this is a professional environment. But then at the very end he does this. <laughs> So it's interesting that uh, this device that had like so much promise and was so cool is something that angered people so much that there are 30 year old men 15 years later still bitching about it on the internet. <laughs> so that's how bad this thing was. It was so bad that you would still complain about it so much later once YouTube had been invented. Um, so I kept digging. I wanted to know how on earth could we make a product so bad it would anger people to this extent. And I found out some other interesting things. There's a really great article that was released around the time the Power Glove came out where they talk in detail about the production process. Um, it, I found all of this stuff through Bill Buxton. Bill Buxton has an online, uh, an online museum of interesting interface objects, and the Power Glove is one of them. And he links to an article from a publication called Design News. So that's the background. If you want to look any of that stuff up, I thought it was really interesting. But the highlights are that this glove was built off of another product called the VPL Data Glove. The VPL Data Glove cost $10,000 per device, and it was made for astronauts so that they could make repairs on the space shuttle without having to get outside into space. Because spacewalks are incredibly expensive and incredibly dangerous, they thought, we'll have some robots do it and we'll control them from a glove because, you know, why the heck not? Um, so they made this really expensive glove, and Mattel and their partner AGE had the incredibly difficult task of turning that $10,000 product into a cheap consumer device that could be sold to families to play video games. As you can imagine, that entailed some rather massive engineering and design challenges. Challenges that would require a lot of talent and a lot of expertise. And they also set a really rigorous schedule for themselves. So this quote at the end that you probably read by now, um, one of the guys on the team said, this was a total fire drill, which is a term that we still use all the time. Um, we were doing design, software, and hardware all in parallel. And I thought that this was really getting interesting now because this has a lot of parallels to the type of work that, that we all do in interactive, right? Like half of our projects turn into fire drills. You're doing things in parallel that should be done in sequence. And so I think that there's a lot of lessons we can learn about what went wrong with the Power Glove in terms of thinking about building our own products and our own services and how we can avoid building the metaphorical Power Glove in our own lives. So looking at, um, again, these three perspectives on making a new product, you can think about a product from, from a number of perspectives, but if you think about these three as sort of the core, uh, there's the business perspective, what sort of problems is this going to solve, uh, how am I going to make money off of this idea, maybe you don't need that when you start if you're online, but what sort of business problem is this going to solve. Then the technology problems are how are, how are we going to solve it, um, what sort of technological things do I have to overcome to make it work, and then the user perspective, uh, what does this do for people, why would anyone want to use it. And so most companies, you probably know this, but most companies approach it this way. 
Like, no matter what they learn in business school, they start off with their own business problem. They think, we need to raise revenue by 10%. So they start with their own business, and that's the why. That's what starts. And then they think, well, we're really good at Ruby on Rails, so I guess we'll make another one of those. And so technology becomes the how, and then the users are sort of the who, the people who at the end, they, they get sold on this sort of a thing, um, and they're expected to bring in all the money. With the Power Glove, they went about it in an interesting way, in that they started with technology. They said, hey, we have this awesome glove that we licensed from NASA. I bet that we could get some business to sell this as a Nintendo controller. And users then become the how. It's the how on how to sell the business to turn this expensive data globe into a consumer device. And now we all know, as people who work on the internet, um, that it should really be this way, where you start with the user, and the user is the why, that the product needs to serve some, some end for the user. Technology becomes the how, the facilitator, in order to do something for business, to solve a business problem. And that we should start with the user and work backwards from there instead of the other way. Now, traditionally, this is marketing 101, right? You define your market, you decide how you're going to serve them. Marketing 101. Uh, about four or five years ago, designers ran into marketing 101 and started calling it UX, and that's great. So now this is UX 101, and it just came out a couple of years ago. But we're all user-centered people, and so we should start with the user at the end. Now, in my group, uh, at our company, we, we have like a little saying that every project starts with people. And this is like a principle that we live by, even though it sounds a little chill, uh, cheesy when it's up there on a slide by itself. But we really mean that. Like every project, whether it's an internal project, whether it's something that we're doing for our clients, or whether it's something that we're doing for our client's customer, needs to start with thinking about people. Who is this for? What is it going to do for them? What sort of problem is it going to solve for them? And thinking about what sort of problem it's going to solve for them. There's a million things that are wrong with the power glove in the way that it was implemented. But even more than that, even more than solving the problem in the wrong way, they, I'm, I'm convinced that they didn't start off by even finding the right problem. And a lot of people talk about um, good design as solving problems for people, or people-centered approaches to solving complex business problems or something like that. And I would submit that more than figuring out how to solve the problem, it's important to find the right problem to solve in the first place. And that's really one of the best things that user research and customer insight can do whenever you're going to launch a new venture. So thinking about the power glove, thinking about the stuff I do for my job now, and how much I love video games, I thought, what would happen if Nintendo had done a short study before they made the power glove? What problems would they have found instead? Um, and how could that have changed the concept in building this device? So I decided that I was going to do that study. And I did it in about a week and a half while working my normal job. So I knew I was going to have to work my normal job. This couldn't be something that took a lot of time. It couldn't be really expensive because the original project that Nintendo was doing for this glove was really low budget and really fast and really short. So I tried to replicate those conditions a little bit. And I decided to take a uh, quick guerrilla research approach to this. Um, guerrilla research is a very lightweight research method. It's not quantitatively sound. It's not for uncovering every problem that your users have. The point of doing guerrilla research is to get your designer, or get you as the designer, out of your own head. You have a perspective on things uh, that's weird because you're an interaction designer, and you live in the world of interfaces every day. So getting yourself out of your own head and thinking about things from a user perspective, thinking about the context that they're in, is, is the first step to really questioning your idea and figuring out if you're solving the right problem. And once you've done something like that, then you can decide if you want to spend a lot of money on a really good, huge, robust study, or whether you want to scrap your idea and start with something else. But there's a number of different places you can take it, but you can really start with a short, cheap study up front and go from there. And so that's what I did. My study focused on five families. I paid them each $50 to spend an hour with me talking about the way they play video games. And so the first thing we would do is uh, I'd ask kids, like, show me the last game that you've played. And, uh, and then I would talk to them about it. So why do you like this game? What's really good about it? Do you normally play it with your brother here, or do you play with other people? Do you play by yourself? And the point of this was just to observe kids playing games, see the context where they play them in their home, and talk to them, get a, get a conversation going, so that we could talk about um, a little bit more abstract things later. In the second activity, I wanted to examine the relationship between a controller and a video game. 
So I printed out eight pictures of different controllers, and I'd go through them one by one and ask the kids, um, what do you think this one would be good for? How would you hold it? What types of games would you want to play with this? And then at the end, I would lay out all the controllers, and we'd go through and talk about the different types of games. So which one of these would be good for a football game, or a racing game, or which one's good for Mario, or stuff like that. So we'd go through, and if they had specific games they'd showed me themselves, I would start with those. So when you play LEGO Star Wars, which one of these do you think might make it more fun? Stuff like that. And I did all of these questions, all of this stuff, in the context of the family. So I would try to get the parents involved. Um, that's also helpful so that they don't feel like you're sort of creeping out on their kids. You're not just like, sitting in the corner. I'm going to watch your child play with you. <laughs> it doesn't have to be weird like that. You can get the parents involved. You can talk to them about um, when you guys are buying a new game, who sort of makes that decision? How do you think about it? How do you talk about it? And in a lot of families like this one, they, th these kids were interesting because they played Nintendo and they knew everything about the original Nintendo and dad plays it with them which was super cool and uh, made me a little bit jealous. And I hope that I can do that someday because it'd be super fun. Uh, so let's talk about what I discovered in doing just these, these five interviews, this quick study, my findings. The first one, and this is cheating a little bit, was to look at the way that kids use motion in video games. Um, so does anybody want to guess what he's doing in this really short clip, like what type of game this is? Just shout it out. Fly fishing? Okay. What? Sword fighting? Yeah, it looks like he's like slashing over a head, or maybe he's like smashing something with a hammer. Go for Listen, game. Go for game? Yeah, it's kind of like a, the, the whack-a-mole type thing. This kid's playing Tiger Woods Golf. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't even like Wii Golf, where it's kind of silly. This is like the serious <laughs> golf game on the Wii, like the precise one. And he's just swinging overhead because he's in like a really confined space in his basement. And he doesn't really care about like lining it up and doing a perfect golf swing. He'd rather swing this way. It's more fun anyway, and it works better in his basement. So that's what he's doing to play Tiger Woods golf. Um, the second thing that I observed was that there was a lot to notice around the physical context that kids play games in. So a lot of times we'd see kids in some sort of really comfortable room where there's couches and they're kind of like laying down, doing the minimum amount of motion required, uh, often in a basement. <laughs> These kids are in that super constrained room. There's cords hanging all over the place. The TV's like about to fall off a stool. And so they kind of have to be careful where they're moving in there or else they're going to knock over uh, all the storage stuff that's on the walls around them. So a lot of like really confined spaces and a lot of spaces that dictate the way the kids are going to play games. We also looked at the social context in which kids play games. Um, and I know some really interesting things there. If, if you've ever worked with kids, or if you have kids, or if you've ever seen someone who has kids, which should be all of you, and then <laughs> you'll know that kids like never, ever, ever, ever stop moving while they're awake, unless they're doing one thing, and that's sitting in front of a TV. And when they sit in front of a TV, it's like something turns them off all of a sudden, and they just sit there and stare. And a kid playing a video game by themselves will stare into the TV and not even blink. And you'll come back half an hour later and tears will be running down their face because their eyes need lubrication, but they refuse to blink. And so the idea that kids are going to sit and play video games by themselves with this glove moving all over the place is, seems in this context to be a little bit silly. The only way that this is not true is if you bring another kid in and they're playing a game together. So when a kid's playing a game by themselves, the game's taking place up in their head and the whole game is in their head and the room disappears. They're in a state of flow and they're just focusing. But you bring another kid in and all of a sudden the game is taking place between them in both of their heads and the physical space becomes part of the game again. And they'll start knocking into each other and they're talking to each other and they're maybe like pointing things out and they're like, go, go, you get over, come on, cover me. What, what is wrong with you, cover me, or whatever. <laughs> so the game comes out of their heads and becomes part of the physical space. And that's a place where uh, direct manipulation controllers make a lot more sense and become a lot more relevant to kids. Another thing, another finding we had was around distractions in games. So there's a lot of other things going on. <laughs> Bam! So in this scenario, I'm talking to them. This little guy walked up, and to his credit, he gave me a sword first, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it until he started hitting me. <laughs> Which is why 
doing design research is so much fun. You'll see me here I'm finally able to defend myself. I'm like, all right, hit this, just don't hit me, please. Uh, but there's tons of weird stuff going on in the rooms while kids were playing games. And you have to imagine that like, I'm an outsider, and so they're trying to be on better behavior for me. So it's even weirder when I'm not. <laughs> But there were like babies rolling around on the floor, like right behind kids playing Wii. Uh, there was a little sister dressed up in a princess outfit who came and paraded around in front of the TV. So like all sorts of strange stuff was going on in the room, and a kid has to like deal with or not deal with that while they're trying to play a game. Um, in talking about the controllers, when I asked where the glove would be valuable, all of the kids responded with things that related to hands. So throwing, punching, swinging, stabbing, or this kid's doing, uh, he said, forcing things. And I think he meant like shooting lightning out of your hands like Darth Vader or the Emperor or something. So that's what he's doing there. So again, it's like all hands. And then games that didn't make any sense to them were things like racing games, or things that involved feet, or really anything that didn't involve hands. Um, they didn't think that the glove would be good for it. So thinking about all of that stuff, everything that we heard from kids in our study, let's revisit the Wizard movie and look at Lucas Barton. So first of all, I don't know where Lucas is supposed to be in this clip, but he's in some kind of weird sunroom, and there's a drinking fountain attached to the wall. <laughs> so he's not in a comfortable space, he's not in a normal space where a kid would play video games. And then second, he's got a wall-mounted TV in like 1989, it's ways probably 80 pounds, and it's attached to his wall. Very few people had those things. Usually you had some kind of entertainment center, right, that your TV barely fit into and that you pinched your fingers putting it in. But he's got a wall-mounted setup, which is perfect for that gigantic controller bar. He's got a super glue onto the outside. Um, his room is totally empty, there's no furniture, and in the clip he's in there playing by himself. His cronies run in to set it up and then they disappear. And beforehand it was just on like Jerry Springer or whatever, uh, all by itself in the room. So this doesn't really look like a real context where kids play video games at all. This doesn't really look like um, the sort of thing real people do. But it probably makes a lot of sense if you think that Nintendo thought about video gamers like this. And that's why they invented a product like this, because this power glove makes a lot of sense in a room where there's no furniture, no distractions, and I don't know if you've got a bionic arm, that still doesn't make sense, but otherwise this thing makes sense in this context. But that's not the real context, that's not the real world. And if they would have spent some time doing some research, they would have gotten some better ideas. They could have gotten out of their own heads and thought about the real world and made this a better product. So what's the right problem? What's the thing that they should have done back in 1989? Well, our findings give us a couple insights that they could have acted on, or things that they could have done further studies on. The first is that this idea of direct manipulation is really great. Uh, people who I talked to thought that this would be really fun, but you've got to boil it down to a couple actions. Kids are pretty imprecise, right? Their muscles are still developing, they do all sorts of weird, jerky things, and um, they, so you've got to boil down the interaction into just a couple motions. You can't have them have to do this really precise, refined thing. Uh, second is you have to provide a lot of constraint and a lot of margin for error, which, which goes with the first one. You've got to give them good boundaries so that if a kid swings like this, Tiger Woods still swings his golf club in a nice, <laughs> smooth way so that you can succeed in the game without having to actually be good at the motion you're doing. You have to provide a clear link between that action and the game so you can't like flex your pointer finger and have Mario jump because this doesn't, this doesn't mean jumping in any visual language in the world, and you should make it a social activity, because kids are much more into direct manipulation when they're playing with other people. So if we think about applying some of this stuff to the idea of Lucas Barton, uh, how would it change the wizard? How does it change the context that we, the Nintendo's thinking about the power glove? Well, first we change his location. So I'm going to put him in a living room instead of that weird sunroom thing. Maybe it's a living room that's right at the front of his house, so Fred Savage doesn't have to walk down into his basement and worry about getting attacked by someone or something. But uh, it's an open space, there's lots of couches that kids could sit down on. You could still make it kind of menacing since he's the bad guy. Um, I don't know, maybe there's other people with mullets in there or something. But you can make it sort of 80s weird. And then second, his friends are not just sort of running around like watching a talk show or something in there ahead of time. They're practicing with the glove. They're playing with each other. And we're going to show kids, in this clip, we would show kids playing together and how much fun they're having, even if they're supposed to be bad guys. So now we would make Super Glove Ball a two-player game, and the kids are playing together, throwing the balls and grabbing and running into each other and all of that kind of stuff. And then when Lucas goes up to show off, 
He's not going to play this boring racing game. Uh, you can still have the guitars wailing like crazy, but now we're going to have him play Punch-Out. Because Punch-Out is one of the coolest, most successful video games that Nintendo ever made, and it makes a lot more sense with a glove, right? You could just be punching, and so you're fighting and you're punching and you're punching, you're not like driving a car. And this action is a lot better on the shoulder, too, because you can do a few of these and then put your arm down while you're, while you're dodging around or something. So you can see this would have really changed the way they thought about the glove. Maybe there's other research they needed to do, maybe there's more prototyping they could have done from there, but with just a very simple study, and just looking at five people, they could have really changed their initial um, conceptions of how this should work. They could really question some of their underlying assumptions. And the thing about doing design research is you're going to do it one way or another. You can do it before you launch your product, or you can do it with your real product, and you can get feedback from your users by watching your production company go out of business and your market share drop and seeing huge disastrous problems in the marketplace. You can find out beforehand or you can find out afterhand. And Nintendo found out afterwards. And they used those insights to help them get it right finally in 2005 when they came out with the Wii. And you can see so much of the Power Glove in the Wii. The Wii is like the spiritual successor to the Power Glove that finally gets it right. It's social, it's constrained, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, most of the actions you're doing translate well to swinging or slashing or poking or swinging or whatever. So Nintendo finally got it, they finally got it right. But now the challenge for them is that it's been another seven years since this came out and they haven't done anything. And since then Microsoft and Sony have both caught up. Microsoft came out with Kinect, Sony came out with Wii Move, and it's up to Nintendo to revolutionize gaming again or turn into yet another one of those companies that just kind of owns characters and makes video games. And so I hope that this time, when they go to look at how they're going to change gaming, um, they'll talk to their users, they'll spend some time doing more studies, and they'll, they'll think about this so that they don't wind up building another power glove, because this time it could cost them the business. So in closing, the thing I want to ask you is, what do you do when you're coming up with a product? Do you just kind of like think about it, come up with good ideas, and possibly make a power glove? Or are you talking to your users? Are you doing short studies? Are you out there in the field finding out how people are going to use your product and understanding its context so that hopefully you can get it right? If you are and you're wanting to take the next step, there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, I don't know if this font is too small or not. There's lots of good books you can read on the subject. There's that sketching user experience book I talked about. There's a guerrilla research book specifically coming out really soon. Um, that you can take a look at. There's some others up there. There's also really good training that, um, that some companies provide. I think IDL and Frog both do things like this. Maya does. Our company provides it too. Um, but whether it's with us or whether it's with someone else, engage with somebody who can help you discover the right process and the right types of questions you can, you can use to, to talk to users effectively. So with that, I think we have just like maybe five or ten more minutes for questions here. Um, if you have the app, or if you have another way, I don't think they do paper, but please fill out some feedback on the session. I'd love to hear what you thought about it. Um, and I think you guys maybe have a microphone. If anybody has questions, I'd love to, to talk about it here. Yeah, in the back over there. Do we have, do we have the mic? I can yell. Okay, go ahead and yell. <laughs> So long to get to fixing, to fixing that. I don't know. Can that? Okay. Good. Yeah. So the question was, why did it take Nintendo so long to get things right? Why did they have so many bad controllers along with this? And I think it. Am I off again? Can you guys? You're off. There you are. Okay. There we go. That's weird. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I think that Nintendo spent so long trying to recover from some of those big failures that it left a big opening in the market and Microsoft and Sony were able to jump in. Um, I think that they just were going with brilliant ideas too many times. It starts with the glove and then over and over and over they're like, what about Virtual Boy and what about Rob the Robot? And they come out with all these crazy things. Yeah. I, I'm not sure why, but it's taken a while to <coughs> figure, figure it out. Yeah, over here. Yeah. 
It's very frustrating. Yeah, so what do you do? Do you, I mean, you walk away. Do you, I mean, how do you engage a client that's hiring you to build a power glove? To build a power glove? My, my, my on again. Yeah, keep going off. Okay. Yeah. So the question was, um, how do you deal with your own company or a client wanting to build a power glove? Um, do you walk away? Do you get a new job? Or do you do you just keep building power gloves for them because that's what they want? Well, I think part of like the beauty of guerrilla research in this approach is that even in very short amounts of time, without breaking your budget or without breaking your schedule, you can get quick feedback from users that can really change people's minds. So I would bet that if you talk to five people, put together a couple slides, some short video clips, and just show them like, hey, I know you guys are really set on this idea, but we ran it by some people, and here's what they said. Um, I think you'll, you'll start to see that people will change their minds really quickly when they start to hear it from outside sources. If it's just your opinion versus theirs, it's, many of them will never change. But they come back and they talk to five as well, and they think it's a really good idea. Well, I mean, that's probably a good area to do some some farther research then, and it might be a way to sell them on a bigger study. Say like, well, you've got five. We heard from five that it wasn't any good. So let's do a more quantitatively valid study. Let's set up like an intercept on the website. Start grabbing some people. Let's do some A/B testing something like that. And in the end, maybe they're right, right? Like maybe the thing that we as designers think is a product love turns out to be a brilliant idea. But again, wouldn't it be great to know that before the thing launches? Yeah? Uh, so I work for a company that just tried to incorporate a Scrum production process. And we ran into a lot of problems that you mentioned when they created the Power Glove because everything was trying to overlap. Um, do you right. see uh, room for that type of process in this field? Yeah, so the question was, um, in, in your company you just started to implement Scrum and you saw a lot of similar problems where things were happening in parallel. Is Scrum something that can work in this field? Yep. That, okay, yeah. Um, I think Scrum absolutely can. As, you know, having a developer background, I love Agile. I manage ch uh, chores at our house with Agile. <laughs> Agile will work up in the wall. It's great. Um, but, I mean, you have to do it right, right? Like, there's a reason that the waterfall process exists. It's the logical way that you would think about building software, um, but it doesn't mean it's the right way to build software. But I, I would say that like badly done Agile is worse than badly done Waterfall. So you've got to take a lot of care to set up your sprints in the right way and to have design happening um, in the right uh, sort of synergy with development so that you don't have all this conflicting overlap. And, I mean, one of the best ways that you can do that, I think, is to get developers involved in the design process and if you can get designers who code, I know that that's like a hard thing to do, but to have people who can go both ways, um, you'll have a lot more appreciation for the other set of skills and the set of problems that are associated with it, and it makes those rapid turnaround times a lot easier to deal with. Yeah, and then just behind. Um, on the web, uh, on the web and also, um, you know, for web-based products and, and more digital kind of like interactions, um, a lot of the work that's done now have data behind it already, so you, you have analytics on your website if you're doing a redesign or whatever it is you're doing. Um, can you talk a bit about your experience in using a combination of quantitative and qualitative data? And also, in addition to that, uh, in my experience, one of the problems you run into in that situation is that designers actually push back on data stuff, and that's actually a big challenge working with creative people uh, with data. So we'll with that. Sure, yeah, so the question was, that um, today with web analytics we have a lot of quantitative data to go with qualitative ideas and that sometimes designers have a hard time and want to push back against the data. Um, I guess I would say first on the first part about mixing qualitative with quantitative, it's, it's great, it's awesome. If you have that quantitative data to start with, the best thing it can do is uncover problem areas that you can do qualitative research or other types of studies to figure out like what's the problem. You know people drop off on page X. Why do they drop off? Maybe they can't find that button, or maybe the page doesn't need to be there, or something like that. So uncovering where the problem is is something great that you can do with, with quantitative data. And then you can use some qualitative methods or, or more uh, user validation type methods to figure out what the right way to solve it is. Um, as to having designers who, who aren't interested in hearing about the data or push back on it, I would say that if you can, if there are ways to involve them in the research process, get them to like hear firsthand from users what's happening, I found that to be like really effective. But I mean, the best thing that you can do is hire designers who 
care about what's going on with their end user, right? I know that doesn't, that doesn't really help, but um, I, I don't know. I found in the design world that there's a much bigger culture of critique than there is even with developers, and they're usually really open to being challenged in a way that if you walk up to like an architect and you tell them their code structure is maybe wrong, they get really defensive. So uh, I don't know. I know there's this like perception of creative people as prima donnas or something, but in my experience, like developers are sometimes worse. So, okay, maybe just like two more questions. Oh yeah, sorry, over here, guys standing up. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the talk today. Uh, it was highly uh, entertaining, but also informative, so thank you for that. Oh, thanks. Uh, earlier you talked about the Power Glove being uh, a failure for Nintendo. Uh, didn't maybe generate as much revenue as they hoped it would. Um, and we were talking about how uh, Nintendo kind of got it right with the Wii uh, in 2005, but you also mentioned that over the past seven years they haven't really capitalized on this. And I also, I, I guess I'm kind of fearful that uh, both Sony and Microsoft are jumping on this bandwagon of uh, this like exaggeration of motion controls and stuff. Do you, are you fearful that maybe the, the trend in the market right now is going to kind of uh, implode or if there's going to be a backlash against that or what are, what are your kind of thoughts about the uh, future of uh, gaming controls moving forward. Yeah, um, I really hope that what's going on in the market right now just leads to more, more refinement. I think one of the things that, that allows the market to exist in the current way it is, where there's such a wide spectrum of types of games, is that gaming has become much more accepted than it was before. And gaming's integrated into people's lives in a way that it wasn't in 1989. In 1989, like, nine-year-old boys played video games, and that was it. But that was the only market that Nintendo went after anyway. That was the perception. And now, it's something that it's like cool to have at a bar, or people want them at nursing homes, and stuff like that. Um, some of the families who I, I met with, two of them, the kids only play games on their iPods, on like an iPod Touch, which was incredibly interesting to me. I would have thought that every one of them would have had a console. So I think that the market has widened so much that there's a lot of area for specialization. And so I don't think that there's going to be an implosion or a reaction against direct manipulation control, um, like Kinect or the Wii, so much as you'll get a lot more focused attention to it. So games that use it will make a lot more sense. Hopefully it'll be less gimmicky and it'll be more of an integrated feature as it matures. Yeah, good question though. Any other, maybe like one more, yeah. Uh, let's say you do this right, you do a lot of great, sorry, uh, a lot of great research. Um, what have you found have been the best way to translate all of this stuff you find to your development team? Because I, I, I do this, I'm a product manager, I try to bring in our designers and developers when I can, but we're paying them so much money per hour, I can't bring them on every meeting I go to okay. and research. Yeah. So it, is it sketches, is it clips and videos, is it a combination of that? I mean, what have you found is the best way to translate what you find so that they can then take it and run with it? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of like magical team, which sounds like it isn't an option, yours would be to have like a designer and developer and a research person who could all work in parallel in like all the different things, right? And I found that when it comes to design research, if you have a trained design research person leading the research engagement, you can use other people from other fields to do the other, other parts of it. So designers and developers can get involved in really productive ways and they've got like amazing perspectives on what you hear and what you find. So it can be really, really productive and valuable. Um, but that said, like if that's not an option and you can't do that in your organization, there are there's some like really good deliverables that you can use to be that transition point. Um, sometimes we, I mean, a lot of research activities will generate personas, and everybody knows about personas these days, so that's one thing. Um, we also do customer journey maps, where we'll show a map of the journey, all the different segments, and how people reported that they feel along that way, and that helps highlight pain points. So you can say these are the main areas that we need to fix. Um, but oftentimes, if you've got a siloed organization and it has to be that way, developers are getting stuff from design, and so it's probably the consistent things that designers have to output, whether it's annotated wireframes or design specs or stuff like that. I don't know that the research has too big of an implication on it, um, but it, I think it is incredibly valuable for developers to hear the research when they get those design artifacts as well so that they know why the designer made these decisions, and that hopefully helps them um, integrate the design into their own brain faster and appreciate it a little bit more. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, everyone, again, so much for coming.
really good rest of the conference, and I'll be just outside here if anybody wants to talk more about anything.